So that was my phone flickering on and off, blacking out and then lighting up again and blacking out and lighting up again. And all my calls are like that. And actually, that wasn't too bad compared to what it was like before I started recording on Photo Booth. So every time I make a phone call, I have to quickly put the phone on speaker. That's the only way to prevent it from blacking out. Otherwise, it goes in and out, trying to um, go goad me. And this is how, uh, it, it, fortunately, I don't have to, well, not fortunately, but um, I don't make too many phone calls. In fact, I make no phone calls. The only thing, the only person I call is the person I just called and then um, service providers. And I have to call service providers at least once or twice a month to pay a bill so that they can get their $3.50. And then, of course, I'm on the phone for about an hour. But that's it. And every time I make a call, as you saw in the beginning of the video, it goes in and out like that. That's not normal. And what that is, is the phone blacking out. And as you saw, every time, even just touching the phone, it should light up but it never lights up. So that's uh, documentation on how they um, have the phone blacking out. Now, the other thing I wanna say is that even while recording the phone blacking out, going in and out with uh, lighting up and blacking out, they still did it. Even even documenting did not at all um, pacify them. It did not at all, um, you know, check themselves. They their brazenness and their sense of um, how you know they they have a sense of invisibility that's quite shocking, and. Of course, you know, hopefully if you've been following my Twitter for a while, you should pick up that there's corruption going on. Um, as I've tweeted a couple of days ago, there is no way that the amount, of, the number of complaints that I've read and that each time I read a complaint that mentions they filed a police report, I document that in the title, in the file name, and there's hundreds. There's just no way for as many people that have uh, pointed out that they've reported to made a uh, police report along with uh, filing IC3 um, and uh, their attorney general and the identity theft.gov. No one is noticing what's going on. And yet this is a epidemic, a national epidemic. And that's fraud, a massive fraud um, of identity thefts, compromised devices, and hijacked businesses. And it's fortunate for me that I'm able to fight back and that I've also been able to um, figure it out. And the only reason why I figured it out was because the one person uh, stepped forward from, from um, hiding behind the scenes. If he was, if he had never approached, if, if he had never stepped forward, it would have been much more harder to uh, figure out. Because even while, what's amazing to me about all this, and I, you know, when the day comes that I'm liberated um, and I'm once again a free citizen, um, I, I there's quite a few things that I've learned about this experience, and that one of them is. Um, we are so cyber crimes are so nascent and it's such it's such a uh, novel uh, topic that even while I'm documenting and showing real time evidence of um, harassment and not only that, but just documentation on before and afters and uh, um, influenced Internet and uh, compromised devices, people are still doubtful. And one of them is the person that I just called. Although he's not, he's never checked out my Twitter. He's never checked out my Substack. And for the most part, he's someone that doesn't really take, that doesn't at all take me seriously. And 
he's of the mindset, despite being a, a doctor, a medical doctor, he's of the mindset to be easily swayed by disinformation. And that's very interesting to me because, um, like I said, this person's a medical doctor. So you presume that he would be smart enough to not be brainwashed, you could say, but yet he's susceptible to that. And he, despite the fact of knowing me for as long as he's known me, and I should think know my character, although, you know, we, the, uh, how we've, uh, our relationship as even friends, um, I first met this person on OkCupid and uh, we saw each other for a little while, but really we're not meant to be together. He's, uh, we're not, we have very different personalities. And, um, but he, you know, and that doesn't mean that he's a bad person, nor am I. It's just, you know, it's some people, you're, you know, not everybody's meant to be just like, I'm not meant to be with the con artist. I have values. I'm smart. And I don't want to live a life of crime. And I certainly don't want to hurt people. So it, it's, a, it's the same way. Although this person is by no means a criminal um, and he certainly doesn't mean to hurt people, but he certainly has done a lot of damage to me. Um, even before the cyber crimes, he did damage to me. But now he's doing damage by believing strangers who, are, who, who are fit, fall under the category of terrorists. And while there's terrorism happening um, in other parts of the world, this person that knows me and knows I should that I, I'm a good per he should know that, which is why he keeps contacting me. I'm certainly not the one contacting him throughout the years. And uh, you know, um, I have I'm certainly eccentric, um, and I certainly um, I'm I'm a little feral in my ways, and that's because I didn't have a normal life. I I grew up in a I didn't, I didn't have stability and I certainly didn't have any parental figures or family members in my life. So I'm feral in that sense. And I've had to be my own parent and confidant and uh, guardian. And, you know, if, if I'm a little wild in some ways, you're going to have to make some allowances. If we can make allowances for people like Carl O'Donnell, who, who can be quite charming and, uh, you know, he, and because he's a charming white male, he gets away with a lot of stuff. Well, um, you know, maybe we can apply that same kind of thinking to people like myself who look, who, you know, it's a testament to me that no one can believe that I have complex PTSD. We presume in our society that people who have uh, disabilities, that they're visible. And even just, I was reading a book one time on, um, a disabled person and she one of the things that she kept being told because she wasn't always disabled was um, you're so pretty for being disabled and that just doesn't make any sense it's like really like only ugly people can be crippled and in a wheelchair um, you know accidents happen and um, it's not always a slob and in fact handicapped people aren't slobs it's it's you know who are fucking slobs? Fucking the con artists who can't generate their own income. They're the fucking slobs. But people who are born handicapped and disabled, that's no fault of their own. If you're pro-life, you shouldn't have any problems with uh, uh, disability. Okay? And uh, it's amazing to me that despite the fact that I'm high functional and that I, I guess I just have the appearance of um, someone who's got our shit together so much that it's just incomprehensible for people to believe that I have complex PTSD. And that's why last year I was just so adamant in trying to squeeze in an MRI appointment, but that the, the, the health insurance I had was also fraud. In fact, the one time that I saw a therapist, I paid out of pocket for that. I paid out of pocket and the, and the, 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 the method of getting reimbursed was you pay out of pocket and then you save the receipt and you go through this very convoluted claim process to get reimbursed. And it's just so complicated and involves such long hold, long wait times. No one's going to pull, no one's going to, you know, you're going to lose a cohort of people 
uh, just in that process alone. So they bank from not only, so not only did the insurance company get to keep the money that should be going to your uh, medical care because they made that process of getting reimbursed so convoluted and such a strain that most people like myself are gonna say, forget it. I'd rather just, you know, it's $120, because that's how much it was to see an in-person therapist who uh, they're influencing, who I tell, you know, they're influencing, and she was so old, she was, a, she was a nice woman, but she also thought I was crazy. She, you know, all she heard was, um, oh, you're a former foster kid, you probably have a lot of issues to deal with, and this is probably one of your issues, so you, you, you make things up to seek attention. That's literally what she said. How do you think that made me feel? I remember having really good health insurance where all I had to do was call up a pro provider, make an appointment, and boom, my insurance covered it, unless there was like a copay. Not with the last insurance. The last insurance was literally set up to be so complicated and such a strainful process that most people are going to say it's not worth it. So they have you pay out of pocket first, and then you have to go through the whole spiel of calling them, which, as we know, takes a long time on the phone, being put on hold. And then you fill out a paperwork, and then you have to wait to get reimbursed, which takes months. Is that really worth it for $120? So that health insurance got to keep my money along with the, the money that they were supposed to give me for that appointment. Okay? Actually, the medical, pr the, the practitioner got paid by me, and then the health insurance got to keep, which is a fraudulent health insurance, got to keep the money that should have gone to that appointment by having me pay out of pocket first. Do you see how that works? And this is what we're up against. And I remember a before and after to my life. I didn't always have generic medication. The health insurance that I just described, the process that I just described, that wasn't always the case. I remember having uh, Aetna at, at the tax company that was in uh, located in Times Square with the husband and wife. They had really good health insurance. And all I had to, I had health insurance the day I started working at that company. And all I had to do was make an appointment. And I had a copay. That's it. This health insurance, where you pay out of pocket first, and then you, if you want to get reimbursed, you have to go through the whole a process of calling them, filling out paperwork, and it takes months to be reimbursed. Most likely, that's fraud. It certainly was fraud with the last insurance that I had. And I know that because everything online, so long as it's on my compromised devices, is fraud. This is the life I'm living. And I'm an American living in New York, the most progressive, supposed to be liberal and tolerant city in the world. And yet, for some reason, I'm shackled to criminals who, so long as they, in fact, so because this person, the person that's been helping me out since my um, unemployment ran out, because he goes up and down like that, it, all it takes is for them to contact him and he deflects the criminal actions on me. And that's a double whammy for me. That's a double assault. Not only am I dealing with all that they're doing that I've tweeted about t uh, t today, the fraud, the harassment, the terrorism, the character defamation, the um, spyware, having zero, you know, just the complete obliteration of my civil liberties. On top of that, I also have someone who is very susceptible to disinformation despite being a medical doctor. And that's very interesting to me. And when I get liberated from this, and I start my own nonprofit, I'm gonna do some research on that. How is that even possible? What is it about the human brain that we're more uh, susceptible to sensationalist, 
sensationalism than to concrete facts. Even while acts of cybercrime are happening in real time, when you have strangers contacting a work email to talk badly about another person, especially a stranger, I don't know these people. And yet they're contacting a person that I know and his work email and then his offspring and her university email. And that's a cybercrime. And despite that, the deflect uh, criminal action somehow gets deflected on me. That's really just beyond comprehension to me and amazing. And as the victim, it's a double, it's a double assault. It's a double whammy. It's like um, what I read in Elaine Scarry's book. So Elaine Scarry is a Harvard professor and she wrote The Body in Pain. And had I finished grad school, I was going to do my dissertation on that book along with uh, Merlu Ponty's Phenomenology because that book, Elaine Scarry's book, The Body in Pain, is about torture. And she talks about her research. She, in, in, a, in a couple of chapters, she mentions torture is just such an a, 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 a abominable act that one person can do that to another person. And what that does, your own flesh, the skin, your, your largest organ, your own flesh turns on you. In other words, it, it's like metaphorically, it's like if your flesh had nails and the nails were going in. And that's what torture is. Where we think of our skin as a protective barrier towards um, tox, you know, toxic fumes and uh, pollution and uh, it, whatever uh, that's harmful to us, like microbes. Our skin protects us. That's our barrier. That's a protective layer that, um, you know, the, of disease, of uh, pollution, and torture. What that, it's just so, it, it's just so unbelievable. And we should one day, I hope to live in a world where that's completely um, unspeakable. Like, the, we, it, it would just be unimaginable to do that to another person. And that's where you start with violence. You eradicate violence. The less violent the world is, the more acts, things like acts of torture just are completely unimaginable. So you start small. And before you get to violence, you get to hate. And you get to toxicity. And that's what these people are promoting. Hate and toxicity. And then the next step is violence. And then the next step is torture. And then the next step is nuclear bombs. But they're so fucking stupid and small-minded, they don't see the big picture like that. So, you know, Elaine Scarry, um, her book, it's a, it's a, and that's what it feels like. It's the same way with my own devices turning on me. Our devices are crucial instruments to our everyday lives. Everything is online, and that was only accelerated by the pandemic. And I can't put in words. It's, you know, I don't have, I didn't, I, I have yet to process what's been happening to me because I'm such in fighting mode. No different from Ukrainians fighting, civilians fighting, and their homeland, except they're out in the, you know, they're in fatigues and in the battlefield. But what I do is I sit in front of my iMac all day, fighting my own battle and trying to restore my rights and my get my life back. And what part of the um, injustice, the monstrous injustice, my own devices have turned on me and they're working for criminals. There's spyware and malware on this device right here, along with my iMac. And I've had this camera covered for over a year, along with my IMAX camera, when I'm not recording as I'm doing right now.
Every email has more than one set of eyes. More, not just mine. Every email that I open, I'm not the only one reading that. Every phone call that I have, it's being listened to. Every text I send, other people are watching and they're laughing at me and they think it's funny. So that was the point that I was uh, getting to before I digress, uh, before I digressed is that every time this person turns on me, I, I, I'm, redu I'm that kid again in a foster home and I feel the burning sensation of instability of where am I going to go? Where am I going to go now? Whose house am I going to go to? What's going to happen to me? Because this person's not dependable. He's too easily susceptible, too easily swayed by terrorists. And this back and forth, while I'm trying to fight to restore my rights, and I have a load of anxiety along with whatever else I'm feeling that I have yet to process. And on top of that, this person is adding to the stress. And I'm, it's like, it's the same sensation I felt as a kid. Oh my God, they got to him. What am I going to do now? I have one month supply of funds before I'm going to be homeless. And I was able to replenish my funds one month in advance. And I always do that. I always I always plan one month in advance. So I was able to do that again by reaching out to a friend of mine who I haven't seen since before the pandemic, but he's such a nice guy, such a nice guy. And he, without even seeing him or really even talking to him, he's helping me out. So he was able to um, let me, he was able to supply one month's funds because this person's totally undependable. And that's how I, that's my strategy. One month, as long as I have that next month covered, I can continue my fight. So this month, um, once again, every day is Thanksgiving for me. I'm thankful yet again that I know I can cover not just December's rent, but January's rent because I've got that covered because I can't count on this person. They're gonna always go to this person. So long as we're continuing to communicate, they're always going to go to him because they know he's an easy target and I can't depend on him. So I have to be preemptive and one step ahead. And I did just that. So I'm able to cover December's rent and January's rent. I have two months that I'm okay. Now I'm 44 years old and I busted my ass to go to college for a better life. And this is how I'm living. And it's very, needless to say, fucking stressful. No different from when I was a kid, moving around. And I just can't believe that I'm in this situation at no fault of my own. While I'm healthy, capable, and educated, and I made sure I got my education because I thought that's all that was necessary to lead a better life. And yet, look at how I'm living. And look at who's doing it to me.